And then I also just wanted to thank you, because recently, in order to put people at ease, I've been introducing myself as Manuel Pastor, uh, professor of sociology from the scandal-plagued University of Southern California, <laughs> where apparently our slogan is, leave no rich and well-connected child behind. <laughs> All the UCLA people are really thrilled right now. <laughs> Still mad at you. Uh, so uh, I got asked to uh, kind of help kick off this conference by uh, talking a little bit about the disparity challenge, uh, the equity imperative, the racial dimensions of this, uh, the digital divide, the future of technology, and the future of Los Angeles. If, as if that was not enough, I was asked to comment on the presidential elections uh, <laughs> and whether or not there was space for one more Democratic candidate. The answer is no. Uh, you know, comment on the North Korean uh, missile negotiations, uh, and then finally, what faux pas will emerge from England this week uh, with the president visiting. Um, so I, I can't talk about all that, but I do want to present some data, uh, a little bit on the disparities that we're, we're talking about and why they're actually so much more pronounced for children uh, and therefore why the work you're doing today is so important and maybe a few lessons to take away as you do that. So uh, we're going to use the automatic slide clicker, which is click. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> so we know, uh, in terms of income inequality in the United States, that it's gotten much worse. What we forget is that it's gotten much worse, in particular in California and Los Angeles. Uh, California used to be in the middle of the pack in terms of income inequality, about half the states more equal, half the states less equal. That's the data from 1969. That's the kind of California that Monica was talking about. It's the California that brought my family here in the late 1950s. We actually moved here from New York uh, because my sister had asthma and the doctor said that moving to Los Angeles would be good for your asthma. This was back in the day when doctors were recommending filter cigarettes as a way to toughen your lungs for the future. So, um, but it was a, there was a kind of tremendous sense of opportunity. California right now is the fourth most unequal state in the United States. More unequal than Mississippi and Alabama, places we've always looked to as beacons of social justice and opportunity. So, We've got a problem, and that problem is actually very much exacerbated in Los Angeles. Um, part of it is the 1% running away from the rest, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute, but a lot of that is what's happening, if you can go back, in the labor market uh, in, in general. And what this shows you is for full-time year-round workers, uh, what's been happening to real wages over about the last 40 years, uh, with the uh, purplish bars uh, being the United States and the uh, green bars being Los Angeles County. So 90th percentile, meaning 10% of the workers make more, 90% make less, 80th, 20 make more, 80 make less, et cetera. And what you can see in the United States, looking at the plum or purple bars, is certainly that those who are at the top of the income distribution or wage distribution have seen their wages rise. Those who are at the bottom have seen their wages fall. But what you can see is that that pattern is actually on steroids in Los Angeles. There's been some increase for those who are at the top of the labor market. There's been uh, a, really a dramatic fall off for those who are at the bottom. The easiest way to think about this uh, is through the next slide. If you go to the next slide, um, which I think if you just hit the, you can, yeah. Um, this shows you for California, uh, sort of wages uh, by education level for 1978 and 2016, all translated into current day dollars. So in 1978, if you had less than a high school degree, you'd make about 19 bucks an hour. If you had a post-grad degree, you'd make about $35 an hour. Um, what you can see as you move to 2016 is that the premium for education has gone dramatically up, and the penalty for being less educated has grown dramatically as well. Easiest way to understand this, at least for me, I'm a professor. I make a lot more money than professors ever made because I can speak a few languages, I'm literate in technology, I can talk to crowds uh, in rooms like this. Uh, my dad was a janitor. 
If he was alive, he would make a lot less money than janitors ever made. And as a result, you've seen this kind of shift in the labor market, which has a lot to do with education. By the way, one misnomer for this, or one word we often use, which I think is inappropriate, is we say it's a change in the return to skill. But I'm not quite sure it's that. How many of you have children? How many of you take your children someplace during the day? How many of you delightfully drop them off saying, this person has no skills? <laughs> that person has skills. They're not necessarily rewarded. Or the janitor that made this room clean so you could walk in, that person has skills. Or the food service worker who makes sure that you're pleased with what you eat uh, on the way here, that person has skills. But we are no longer rewarding those skills in the way that we used to in the past. That's something that's gone haywire with our labor market. Next slide. Um, of course, this is a poverty. This is a problem that's not uh, equal opportunity in terms of geographic location. The darker areas here have higher rates of uh, poverty, and you can see what's happening through much of South Los Angeles, uh, through parts of East LA, and also into the San Fernando Valley, a place that's changed uh, dramatically in terms of both its income profile and its demographic profile. Huge demographic changes in the San Fernando Valley. It's now got a very large Latino community. Uh, as a result, uh, the very famous Valley girl is now La Muchacha del Valle. <laughs> She's still shopping at the mall, but on her earbuds, there's Cardi B right now uh, going on. So, uh, little nod to the Dominicanos. Uh, so, next slide, please. Um, and of course, there's a racial dimension to this. And I want you to take a look at this slide. We're going to study this, and then we're going to shift the slide in just a, a second. This is median household income by race and ethnicity. For whites, median, meaning have make more, have make less. The uh, median household income is about $76,000. For African Americans, about 41000 For Latino households, about 46000 For the Asian Pacific Islander households in LA County, about 68000 a little bit less uh, than the non-Hispanic white uh, in uh, Los Angeles. One thing about the API community, which is really important to realize, it's a very bifurcated community. Some groups are doing very well, more highly educated, South Asian, Chinese, et cetera. Some groups, particularly Vietnamese, Laotian, Cambodians, doing very poorly, facing uh, significant economic problems that rival those that face African Americans and Latinos. So that median can somewhat distort. But I want you to look. Now, there's a pattern of disparity there, isn't there? But here's what I want you to look at when we go to the next graph. In the next graph, it's at the same scale, but we're only looking now at households that have children below the age of five. Next slide. Look at the disparities. Now, if you could flip back with the left arrow key and then go forward again. What you can see is that, yes, there are disparities, but those disparities are even sharper for households that have children. White households that have children, median household income, $111,000 a year. For black and Latino, 43 and 44 for ABI 92. But the big thing here is it means that these particularly African-American Latino children are growing up in economically stressed households, also households frequently lacking access to uh, digital resources. So, and that's exacerbated by the following data point. Next slide which is taking a look at uh, where our children are in school. And what this graph tries to take a look at is whether or not you are in a high poverty school, meaning more than 75% of the kids are on free and reduced price lunches. So if you look for the Los Angeles metro area, less than 10% of white kids are in high poverty schools. About a little bit more than half of black kids and about two thirds of Latino kids are in high poverty schools. We know that you don't deliberately send your kids often to high poverty schools. I did, but that's kind of unusual. Uh, but one of the things about that is that in these high poverty schools, there's often lack of resources with regard to digital uh, resources, often uh, 
significant issues with teachers staying over time, all sorts of problems of concentration of poverty. So when you think about that sort of income profile for the households with children, and then you think about the educational uh, disparities in terms of the schools that people are in, it's very clear that we are baking racial inequality into the way that we are running our labor market right now, and also the way that we are running our educational system, and we need to begin to address that. Next slide. So how does that relate to this conference? I want to suggest to you that there's a couple of things that are sort of um, new about the new economy that need to be recognized and owned by the society as a whole, by the high tech sector uh, as well as civic leaders, and by all of us who are seeking to sort of change uh, the odds for people who, will, uh, who are in the situations that I was just talking about. So, First thing to realize is that this innovation economy is generating inequality, and the inequality is baked into the innovation. What do I mean by that? In the old days, if you think about a company achieving a monopoly, like a U.S. Steel, um, or uh, which is a really good example, U.S. Steel or the oil companies, what they tended to do was to take easily replicable processes, like producing steel, buy more and more firms and sort of cor corner the market and achieve monopoly power. That's how they achieve monopoly power. That's not how monopolies evolve in the contemporary market. How many of you use rideshare? How many of you use something other than Uber and Lyft? Right? And the reason why is in the new economy, there's a platform advantage. So if you're the first in to capture the platform, you automatically acquire a monopoly because people aren't going to put 45 different apps on their phone. How many of you, when was the last time anybody used Bing to search for anything? <laughs> right? You all, I mean, we even have an expression, Google. So what is happening is that we are in a world in which monopolies evolve out of the innovations rather than monopolies becoming something of acquiring easily replicable processes. So the monopolies are actually part of the new economy. The second thing that's part of the new economy is clustering. So when you think about uh, whether, you know, when you think about traditional economic theory, I'm an economist by training, but I've, I've reformed economist for a couple of different reasons. Uh, one is I realized that there's this great joke about economists. If you took all the economists in the world and you laid them end to end, they still couldn't reach a conclusion. And then particularly after the financial crisis, someone if you took, said if you took all the economists in the world and laid them end to end, it would be a good thing. Uh, because you know, one of the things we teach you, they actually one of the things we teach you in uh, our initial economics courses is that if you raise the minimum wage, what will happen to unemployment? It'll go up, for which there is no evidence. Second thing we teach you is that companies want to locate places where costs are what? Low. How do you explain the Silicon Valley then? How do you explain 40% of venture capital agglomerating in the Bay Area? People agglomerate because there's uh, a lot of uh, positive spinoff effects from networks, just like there's a platform effect. Those network effects mean that firms agglomerate, and talent agglomerates, and talent sticks. Now, what that means is that gentrification and displacement is built into the innovation economy. It is an externality that should be an internality, uh, internalized, because it is actually part of the economy. The displacement of people in Venice is not some accident of the market. It's an important part of the development that's taken place. Last thing here, which is important to realize, is the following thing, which people don't lift up about this new economy. Uh, behind every software engineer is an army of nannies and gardeners and food service workers. And if you go to Austin and Boston and the Silicon Valley, you find a tremendous amount of less educated immigrants doing the work that also helps prop up those places. But can they find a place to live given these forces of gentrification and displacement and what's being done given the monopolization of economic uh, power and money that's going on? So that's part of our new economy. And in fact, it's hardly an, I mean, if you look at the number of small businesses being created, it's actually on the decline because of the way in which innovation means market capture right now. So what does it mean that we need to do as we go forward uh, with the work that you're gonna be doing today? 
First thing um, is that we need to uh, do something that Americans have a very hard time doing, holding more than one idea in our head at the same time. <laughs> so when I think about what we need to do economically, we need to do three things. We need to lift the bottom. To me, that means minimum wages, labor protections. It also means investing in education, closing the digital divide, looking at these issues with regard to schooling that we were talking about. The second is growing the middle, trying to figure out if we are generating an economy, how do we create spinoffs that actually generate jobs that are in the middle. One of the things, if you looked back at that data on what's been happening with the wage structure, the only group that's been able to hold its real wages over time are folks coming out of the community college system who come into the middle. I know, I love the community colleges too. <laughs> um, for folks who are coming into uh, the middle of the labor market, uh, and there's great jobs that are already there in health, but there are jobs that could be there in advanced manufacturing if we start thinking about what the spinoffs can be from our innovation to do that, and what's the training that needs to happen in schools. Uh, and then finally, we do need to drive the top. I am not making an anti-innovation or an anti-tech argument. I'm saying, how do we take that to drive the economy forward, but recognize that it's creating inequality, displacement, and low-wage work along the way, and sort of fully internalize that into an economic development strategy. Uh, second thing that I think needs to happen is, and I'm really glad this conference is happening for that reason, is we need to ensure that equity is baked in, not sprinkled on. It's not a question of coming up with an economic development strategy and saying, oh crap, we displaced a lot of people and now there's a lot of poor people, how do we figure this out with a little bit of universal basic income? I'm actually not opposed to the universal basic income idea, but the idea that you don't start by thinking about equity at the beginning in terms of who is going to have access, how do we close these gaps, uh, and how do we do it in an important way. Uh, and I think it's really critical for the following reason. I'll ask you again, how many of you have children? Okay. How many of you hope your children do better than you? How many of you hope your children do worse? Maybe just to teach them a lesson, right? So. <laughs> Um, so you'd better hope that your children, but also everyone else's children, do about 60% better than you. And the reason why is that's the increase in the dependency ratio, the ratio of non-working elderly folks, because we're aging as a society, to working age adults uh, in California over about the next 30 years. Because we have less youth, we have less immigrants filling in the middle, we have more of us retiring. We need to invest and close these gaps now in order to have a productive economy in the future. And that's gonna require modeling new forms of collaboration and problem solving, which is I'm hoping what you'll be doing today. Next, last slide. Um, this is really just an advertisement for my book, which is actually quite good. Thank you for mentioning it, Pedro. Uh, but also, we did a book, State of Resistance, looking at uh, the sort of arc of political change in California. And then last year, we released a report called From Resistance to Renewal, a 12-step program uh, for the California economy, because I think we need a little recovery. Uh, and of course, the first step is admitting we've got a problem, uh, which is a little bit about what I've done today. But if I leave you with one message, um, it is this. Um, we often get enthralled by these great stories, and we hear them every day, of someone who grew up in tougher circumstances and wound up being able to succeed. Um, I I'm the son of an undocumented, one undocumented dad. I grew up in La Puente. Uh, we didn't have much money. I could tell that story. But our, we get so fixed on these stories of people beating the odds that we forget that our real task is to change the odds. So that these stories are not unusual, that they become the American norm. So let's work together to change the odds. Thank you very much.